Welcome to the Startup Grind. Kirk Euler is the uh, new CEO of Startup. Uh, he's also the Placer County Supervisor of District 4 and the owner of Renta Group and the co-founder of VidGage. And Start evidently I'm leading you in jumping jacks now. Ready, begin. <laughs> and just like all our entrepreneurs, he's a rock star, so please give him a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's why they stood up. Yeah, so to give you a standing <laughs> So You already get a standing uh, ovation. So I, thought, I thought maybe it was something to do with the technology industry. We sit too much. We need to stand up and move around a little bit. Sounds like a new startup idea. Thank you. So, uh, so part of the interview is, it's, it's, uh, is just to find out a little bit more about you and a little bit about background. So where, where are you from, Kurt? Well, first of all, let me thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Laura and Alina. Um, while by virtue of their public appearances, you might think they work for Rich, uh, they actually do work for me over at SARDA, and they are uh, indispensable parts of our team. So I just want to thank them very much for their role here tonight. Uh, also, one of my board members, uh, Tony O'Donnell for Moss Adams is here. And I believe a gentleman from SMUD, right? Uh, SMUD is very active in SARTA's board as well. And so I want to thank you guys uh, as well for being here and for your constant support of, of SARTA and our mission. And uh, so then to your question, uh, which was, why am I here? Where, where, where did I come from? Um, grew up here in the Sacramento area, um, out in what is today known as Granite Bay. When we moved to Granite Bay in 1970, there was no Granite Bay. Uh, Granite Bay was reserved for two things. There was the Granite Bay entrance to the Folsom Lake State Park at the end of Douglas Boulevard, and there was the Granite Bay Bait and Tackle Shop where Lakeside Beverage sits today. Uh, uh, prior to that, you, I mean, other than that, you either had Roseville on the south side of Douglas or Loomis on the north side of Douglas, and it wasn't until 1987 that Granite Bay actually got its own identity with its own zip code and its own name. So I grew up in Loomis, mm -hmm. and we moved up here in 1970 from Southern California. My father was an appointee in the Reagan administration when Reagan was governor uh, here in California. My dad was um, law school classmates with uh, Ed Meese down at Bolt Hall at Berkeley, and uh, Ed was acting as the, the governor's chief of staff here in California, called my dad, asked my dad if he'd like to come up and join the administration. So my dad packed up the station wagon, literally, packed up the station wagon with uh, three boys, a dog, and a hamster, and uh, drove us up here in, in route. The hamster bit the dog's nose. The dog <laughs> bled all over the car. These are stories I heard. I was only three. What do I know? Um, and uh, uh, it bled all over the car. And then my older brothers learned a bunch of new words uh, when, that, when that happened. Um, and then <laughs> subsequent to us moving up here, my younger brother was born. So raised in a family of four boys, three out of four. And so I'm used to having to fight for what I want. So what was your first job? My very first um, paid job, my, my dad bought an old defunct gas station right on the corner, uh, back then it was very rural, right on the corner of Auburn, Folsom and Douglas. And uh, he turned it into a number of different things uh, over the years. It was a pop shop. I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember the old pop shops where you'd go buy sodas by the case, you'd pick out the bottles. And uh, so he, he owned a number of those. That was a pop shop. Um, but the very first uh, job that I had one winter, he used that corner for selling Christmas trees. And so we went up, I was nine years old, we went up into the, uh, the mountains of a, a, a friend's property, cut down a bunch of trees, brought them down, and I was responsible. They wouldn't let me play with the saw, but they let me play with uh, hammer and nails. And so I was responsible for assembling all of the Christmas tree stands that we nailed to the bottom of the trees and stood them out there. And then I got to help sell the trees and then load the trees. And uh, being a, a, a young scout at the time, practiced my knots mm -hmm. uh, in tying them to the tops of cars, which if you're actually entrusting your Christmas tree to a nine-year-old, you probably <laughs> had a little too much eggnog before you went shopping for your tree. And so that was my very first uh, paid job was, was that stuff. So that inspired you, did you, what did you, from that, do you want, what did you want to be when you grew up? Uh, far away from Christmas tree lots is what I wanted to be. Uh, that had absolutely nothing to do with the, the inspiration. I'll tell you what, 
what I did the, the first time when I woke up and I said, this is what I want to do when I grow up, actually goes back to the Iran hostage crisis. Uh, it was out of the Iran hostage crisis that we got the program Nightline. I don't know if you remember Ted Koppel right. on Nightline. Um, Nightline actually started as the uh, update that they would do after the 11 o'clock news on what was happening with the, uh, the hostage crisis in Iran. And out of that, um, uh, they, they, the Nightline was born. And so um, I actually wanted to grow up and replace Ted Koppel on Nightline. I think you have a, you have the, uh, I think you have the skill set. You would Saying do I talk a lot is what you're... Well, I would say you're an actual politician, which actually goes to, uh, <laughs> which goes to the next question. So on your LinkedIn, you, that's your first job as, as Placer, Placer County Supervisor. I almost said Placerville. Um, so how, is that, was that really your first job? That, that, you know, your big like, first uh, professional job as being the Placer County Supervisor? No, actually I ran uh, government relations for the Sacramento Builders Exchange prior to that. Mm -hmm. Um, I ran, and it was, it was my work uh, with the Sacramento Builders Exchange, managing their government relations, that kind of opened my eyes to local government for the first time. Prior to that, my interest had always been at the state and the federal level. And, um, and, and so in 1991, as we were heading into the 92 election, uh, I was working for the, the Builders Exchange, and I was paying attention to things here locally and regionally. And uh, I was not fond of the votes being cast by my supervisor out in Placer County. And so as we got toward into 92, toward the filing deadline, uh, and it was clear that nobody was going to run against her uh, at the ripe old age of 24, because I know everything, which you do when you're 24, wow. um, I decided to go ahead and file and run for the Board of Supervisors. And uh, then so after I filed, uh, somebody else did. So there were three of us going into the primary um, in the pri and and when you have when you run for a uh, local office like that it's it's not r versus d uh, and if you don't if nobody gets 50 percent of the vote plus one vote then you go to november or runoff in november um, and uh, so i got outspent in the primary uh two to one but uh, the incumbent got 43 percent i got 41 percent the other person got 16%, then we went on in November. And I won by a whopping 67 votes out of almost 20,000 votes cast. I actually lost on election day. This was one of those where, um, maybe there's somebody else in the room that's familiar with that. This is one of those where uh, on election day, the results say one thing, but once all the absentees come in, it said something else. And so uh, don't ever let people tell you that individual votes don't count. Uh, because uh, if the number of people in this room had switched and voted for my, I wouldn't have been county supervisor. So, so what? Uh, I, I guess, so what was, how much did you spend on that, or how how much did you spend on that uh, first election? I'm curious. That one all in between the primary and the general, I think I only spent about fifty-two thousand dollars. Primary was about seventeen. Uh, it was very hard to raise money as a twenty-four-year-old running against an incumbent. <laughs> Um, and actually, of that 17, a big chunk of that was an in-kind contribution from somebody who did a poll for me. Uh, but I just flat out worked her. Uh, I walked every walkable precinct twice. I walked every walkable precinct twice. And I defined a walkable precinct as uh, one unit to the acre or greater in density. Uh, in our area, there's still a lot of rural stuff, 2.3s, 4.6s. Chuck that, wasn't walking that. That's why we have phones. Uh, but I walked every walkable precinct twice. Does that mean you actually walked house to house? House to house. Well, not house to house. We have things called high propensity voter lists. And so you skip the houses of the people that don't vote. Uh, so, but house to house of those people that are actually on the high propensity voter list, yeah. Wow, that's very impressive. And uh, was it, uh, you know, was it as, as campaigning as brutal as it seems? Yeah, yeah it is. Um, it, it, the worst part is, is really raising money. Uh, it's very hard uh, to ask people for money, but it's what trained me well for life in a nonprofit role. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, uh, that's the toughest part. The second toughest part is sticking to the plan because you'll get hit, you'll want to respond, uh, maybe go off message, and, and just stick into the plan. De detaching yourself from the emotion, uh, that's the hardest part. But I'll tell you what, it, it's a lesson that once learned, 
has great application in business as well as the political world. Because if you have a plan, you have a business plan, you're going to get hit. Now, it may not be hmm. an ad, you know, uh, on, the, on the radio calling you a miserable SOB, but in business, you're going to get hit. But if you have a plan, take the hit, stick with your plan, and work your plan. And, uh, and that's, that's uh, it was a good lesson for me to learn in politics, and it's served me well in business as well. Uh, yeah, so is, is the uh, supervisor, is that sort of like a, a, like a councilman? In Folsom, we have councilmen. Is, is right, so um, uh, 58 counties in California, the counties are agencies of the state. Uh, as, as counties, we're responsible for implementing uh, all of the state and federal government programs through health and human services and things like that. Up until a few years ago, the courts also ran through the counties. They've now been reverted back to the state. But um, the counties are also responsible for uh, the district attorney, uh, the public defender, those kinds of things. But to, to the extent that there is overlap, it's all things having to do with the municipal budget as well as land use related decisions. So in Folsom, your city council makes all the land use decisions for the city, but the unincorporated areas around Folsom, Orangevale, that's the county. Okay, so all land use decisions in the unincorporated area. So in Placer County, when you're talking about Granite Bay, that's the county. Roseville, they make the decisions on the city council there. So now that you're an incumbent, is, is it, I assume it's a much easier if you're, when you're campaigning or running for office? Um, it's, it's easier to raise money, but uh, the, the downside to being an incumbent, as a uh, gentleman in the back knows with his boss, the downside to being an incumbent is you have a record. And... I'm always proud to run on my record, at least what I think is my record, but how your record sometimes can be interpreted and put out in the public domain in exactly what you thought your record was. Suddenly it looks a little different. Uh, so that's where it's, it's more, if you're a challenger uh, who's, who's never run before and you don't have a record, it's a little easier to be able to say things and, and not have anything come back at you. You're, 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 you'll be on attack and not on a defensive, essentially. Right, right. But again, I, I, I'm always, I'm cognizant every time I vote that, um, that I'm gonna, I, I better be able to defend my vote. And, and so um, I, go, I go into the public hearings knowing that uh, sometimes you're, you're going to piss people off. I mean, it's, in, at local government level, you're dealing with people's fence lines, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, not, it's not like these guys sitting here in Sacramento or back in Washington. Who, I, I, when I make a decision, it could be on something that's right next door to you. And, and it upsets people. You can never make everyone happy. That's one thing oh, I've no. learned. You can, you're always so don't to, try. Yeah. And by the way, uh, Chris, referring to Keaton, and Keaton is uh, with, uh, Omni Bear's office. with Congressman Omni Bear's yeah. office, and we're happy to have him here with us today. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about that. So uh, the next, it looks like you started, a, uh, you're the owner of a company called Rensa Group. What, what's yeah. that about? So the Rensa Group came out of uh, my government relations background as a member of the Board of Supervisors up in Placer County. Um, it, it's, it's, it necess let's just say that the compensation necessitates that if you want to actually be able to live in Placer County, you better have some additional income other than what they pay you as a county supervisor. And, and so um, I, in the th now, thir I'm in my 13th year as a county supervisor, uh, I've always had other mm -hmm. employment. Um, my background is really in startups, and, and so what, what I found a unique opportunity to do with the Rensa Group was marry my government relations experience with my business startup experience and go and start talking to businesses who have made the decision for whatever reason that um, they want government as a customer or all of a sudden they're finding themselves in a, a, a position where they're being regulated. And businesses will spend untold oodles of money developing their messaging for their customer. They, they then many times fail to realize that that messaging doesn't necessarily translate when talking to government. Government approaches things with, from a different perspective uh, with a different level of concern. And so, for instance, uh, one of the clients that I worked with is, was somebody that um, 
did um, uh, underground piping and, and but did it without primarily trenchless without disturbing and they wanted to go work for PG&E so it was their first time trying to go and, and work for, for PG&E for their, their piping they had historically worked for home builders new home builders well when you're sitting down with JMC John Moore Construction John Moore cares how cheap are you how fast are you that's all he cares about you make me miss a deadline you're gonna pay how cheap are you? How fast are you? You go sit down at pg &E, what do they care about? If I end up in the paper because of you, <laughs> that's what they care about. Keep me out of the paper. You, you, if you, as a matter of fact, you better not be the cheapest because it means there's something wrong with you. So it's, it's really understand your customer, understand where they live as either a regulator or you know, somebody in a regulated environment and help them go and articulate their value proposition. So you, are you helping way. people to sell to specific agencies or is it more like a lobbyist type of function? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Right. No, I, 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 because it's, it's, it's both. For instance, one of the companies that I was with for about three years uh, was in the online gaming space uh, helping uh, to write the rules around regulating online gaming and uh, specifically our company um, U.S. Digital Gaming was video poker and trying to uh, write the laws. Uh, this, this, these cases were in Delaware, Florida, and, and Iowa, trying to write the laws around video poker and getting regulators to understand that the technology does exist to provide integrity of the game, player identification, um, geolocation so that you know they're gaming within your state, uh, appropriate payout, tax uh, capture, all of those things, the technology. Mm. So I'm, I'm meeting with legislators to help them understand that, at the same time having to meet with folks in the industry, especially the established brick and mortar environment folks, to help them understand that rather than fighting this, you might want to open your eyes to the revenue potential associated with it, and here's how we can help you with that. It's kind of the, you got the full wagon there. So yeah, you you gotta you gotta talk to, to to both sides, and again, the the message varies. Okay. All right. So and then uh, you, it sounds like you you also have the uh, co-founder of VidGage. What is VidGage? VidGage is uh, an exciting endeavor. As a matter of fact, my one of my my partners, uh, Brian Jagger, is standing in the back there, making sure I don't screw up and say something stupid. Uh, Brian is a partner with me in both VidGage and uh, Casting Calls America. VidGage is one of those things where. Uh, we thought we had the next best thing, right? The, the next great widget. This is going to take social media by storm. It's all video engagement, VidGage. Uh, mm -hmm. It's all video engagement. It's, we're going to build a social network that's all based around video commenting. So you're going to put up a video of you doing something through your cool GoPro, and we watch you catch air, and then all your friends comment on video, and one of your friends comments with their own cool video of them catch an error and then that starts another comments tree off of that comment and it was all going to be social engagement around video and we put it out there in a beta test and it was fascinating the feedback we got was number one people love the video engagement part but the, the the real feedback we got was hey I love this how can I use this as a commenting platform on my site so yeah, the social media aspect of it is really cool and all, but I have this website, for instance, the folks who run marketing for the New England Patriots. We'd love to have this video engagement platform, this video commenting platform, you know, have Tom Brady get up there, do a little video about something about, you know, next week's game, and let our fans be able to engage in a video format with, with Tom Brady. And Tom can comment back if he wants, or they can just all get in a video fight if they want. It doesn't matter. But um, so we started getting that kind of feedback. And it was one of those rare things where we just said, okay, if that, and we heard it from three, four, five different folks, loved it, and we kind of went, okay, if that's what the market's telling us, maybe we need to step back, and maybe that's what we need to be. Maybe instead of going and trying to create our own social network, Facebook, you know, being the new, maybe this is what the market's telling us. And then it occurred to us, well, now if we've got the VidGage platform on all these different websites, we just solved our single biggest problem, which is customer acquisition for VidGage, right? How are we going to drive people to embrace VidGage if VidGage is just VidGage and not something else? Well, if now all of a sudden VidGage is the commenting platform for Fox News, 
They just created our customer base for us. And now we have our VidGage universe created by virtue of us being a video commenting platform that we provide for free to other websites. So where, where is it? Vid, where are you stand right now on your startup? Where, where is VidGage right now? Are, are we at liberty to discuss at this point? <laughs> um, we we uh, we are in a soft launch mode of a our first site um, tomorrow. Really? Yes. We could, change, site, we could change this to a launch party then. It's a site. <laughs> it's a site called yeah. It's a site called Today's Acting, and uh, you can see it's very complimentary with Casting Calls America. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's a site called Today's Acting, and it's uh, essentially uh, uh, professional actors. People figure out how to make a living doing it, providing advice in blog format and also in video format to start actors starting out. So really, tomorrow's going to be like your first... Yeah, uh, yeah tomorrow's when we go live with VidGage on that site. Breaking the first article is an interview with one from Breaking Bad. Yeah. So he's, he's a feature piece on him uh, will be the first article that people can comment on with VidGage. Oh, Phil? You mentioned uh, uh, Provider Free. Is there a monetization strategy? Yes. <laughs> she is a politician. <laughs> no, ab absolutely. Uh, there's a because there is, um, as with anything video related, there is an attendant advertising component associated with that. Uh, not to mention, you have to create a VidGage account in order to utilize the VidGage platform to um, uh, to comment on these sites. And so we will be building our own user base organically that way. And then you have the advertising. Once people get accustomed to using the VidGage platform, then they know, well, not only do can I engage here, but I can actually go see videos over here. Because everything that will be hosted, for instance, on today's acting or on any of the other folks that we're talking with, none of whose names I can mention right now, um, any of those, all of that content will also live on the VidGage site. So you can access content directly through the VidGage site as well as through the individual uh, websites. And you can follow users from site to site. So for instance, if you are a VidGage user and you like to comment on uh, in and out Burgers site as well as Fox News, then all the videos that you put up showing yourself eating the double-double, um, people can go and see on your account on, on VidGage. So how long, how long did it take you to get to tomorrow? I mean, how long have you been working on, this, on VidGage? Yeah. Two years. Wow. Yeah, I think it's been about that. We should have had this event next week, so we're going to see what that was. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's very exciting. Um, it really is. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. Testing, testing. Is that better? Better. So uh, let's, uh, you know, you've got like four jobs, so the next one is sort of... <laughs> no, I have really good partners is what I have. I... So uh, congratulations on being selected as CEO of uh, a startup. And, and, um, uh, and actually one of the reasons we, we asked you to, to speak to this, in, in many ways I think Sarda is sort of represents the tech community, represents the startup community so. uh, in the Sacramento region. And so, you know, in some ways you're kind of like the, not the... Not the supervisor, but almost like the mayor of the... <laughs> the mayor of Techville, is it? Of, of Techville. Okay. So tell I'll me about that. the selection process. Like, you know, how did, what was the whole steps of, you know, how did you get selected as the, uh, the selection process? So at SARTA, we have a 35-member board of directors. That's crazy. We have an executive committee of 11. 11 executive committee members. I had to go meet with every one of them. And every one of them looked at me and said, you sure you want to do this? No, I'm not kidding. Um, <laughs> they, uh, it was it was um, it was neat because what I got to see it's it's a fairly diverse group. Um, we have uh, folks involved 
in the technology industry. We have folks that are more tangentially involved in the technology industry by virtue of their passion in medicine or agriculture or clean technology, if you will. Um, we have people that are service providers that like to provide services to the technology industry or the ag industry or the medical industry. And so it was, it was a very diverse group to go sit in front of and see how um, my perception of where Sacramento sits today and my vision of where I would like to take at least what we can control of Sacramento into the future, see how that resonated among sectors. And, and it, was, um, it was a very rewarding experience to the, the, the point where by the time uh, I was done meeting with all 11 people, I felt very confident that if given the opportunity to serve as CEO, I had built a pretty good foundation uh, upon which we could, we could uh, create our 2015 game plan because mm -hmm. I had pretty good buy-in amongst those executive committee folks. We could create that 2015 game plan and there would be enthusiasm in the region by virtue of the representation of the fairly disparate groups. There would be good enthusiasm in the region to embrace that and allow us to move forward. And so it was a long process, um, and, uh, uh, but a very rewarding one. Yeah, you know what I like about your background is, you know, coming to throw, you, ha you, you, are, you have been and you are an entrepreneur, and you, ha and you do have your own start, actually a couple startups. So that's what I kind of like, uh, you know, about your own. That way you, you know, you can see it from our shoes, you know, what, what an entrepreneur is looking for, what an entrepreneur uh, needs. And with that said, what, what's kind of your, you know, what, can you talk about what the, the future is for Starter uh, or what the two 2015 game plan is? Sure. Um, and, and, you know, we've talked a little bit about the government stuff and all the rest. And yes, I'm a county supervisor, but I'm a businessman first who happens to believe that through proper public policy we can, we can do some good things. But my heart has always been in business. I, after I left the Board of Supervisors my first tour of duty, um, one, of my, one of the most formative things I did was helping start a company called CarsDirect.com. Uh, we moved down to Southern California and became the f employee number four in what would become in the next 18 months over 650 employees. We raised $360 million private. Uh, we filed our S-1 to go public in February of 2000, then March of 2000. Uh, there was a reality check, and Wall Street said, you know, eventually you guys got to make money. And a lot of us went, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Selling cars on average $6,000 a loss, that's a problem. Um, and so having lived through that experience and, and, and having grown up with Cars Direct in uh, an environment um, like Brandon, has provided here. We were, back then it was called an incubator ID lab in Pasadena. I guess today uh, it would be more of an accelerator as opposed to an incubator. Um, it, was, it was a tremendous experience being solely focused on how do I take this idea to market? What are all of the logistical steps? And really what it drove home is what I intuitively knew, and that is if you're going to do anything, if you're going to, uh, you know, start a business, run a campaign, do it, there are some certain, there's some basic fundamental ingredients you have to have. Money. <laughs> you have to have some money. Um, you have to have some talent. <laughs> I'm looking at everybody looking above my head, which I'm used to, by the way. People looking right over my head. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, that's kind of cool. Our new sponsor. <laughs> it's our new sponsor, so. Um, Twelve monkeys. We don't have two of them anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm in good company, so thank yeah, you. Yeah, that's what I said. Two of them. Thank you. Um, so, so y you need money. Uh, you need you need talent, and you need time. And uh, if any one of those you don't have in a in appropriate abundance getting to the finish line is, is tougher. Mm -hmm. And so at SARTA, we are going to spend 
2015 focus on building uh, the infrastructure necessary for the startup community to be successful. Yes, we are starting our own fund, but um, there are other funds that we will be promoting uh, because we can't fund every deal. We shouldn't fund every deal at SARTA. And in fact, there are some deals we that might not fit us. They might be perfect for Lokesh's company or for Jack's company uh, or for DCA. They might not fit ours, but we as SARTA, even if it doesn't fit our fund, we still are going to make it our job to make sure they get funded. Um, the resources, the, the, the talent, be it that through, through good mentorship from folks that currently serve on our board or in our various advisory committees, our, our ag, our med, our clean, and our next advisory committees, having that mentorship where somebody who can come in with an idea and say, okay, I think I've got something that I'm prepared to take to market. Show me where, where I'm deficient. Help me build and fill in those gaps where I'm deficient. And then key man placement is, is a key component of what we're going to be developing uh, in 2015. And that is, you know, and it, for, for anybody out here that has started their own business, don't take offense when I say this, but sometimes... The best title for somebody who comes up with a really good idea is founder or co-founder, not CEO. And I'm a perfect example of it. With I am. I'm a perfect example of it with, with, with VidGage and, and with, uh, with, with Casting Calls America. Yeah, I, I, I helped to give birth to it, but I, that, that's Brian. That's our other partner who also happens to be named Brian, so it works really well. I just yell, Brian, and somebody shows up. And um, so are you thinking about maybe creating an accelerator or an incubator program? So, so the Venture Start program is going to be the ingredients that you would have in an accelerator program, uh, but it will be um, not in a physical location to start. It will essentially be just virtual. It will be, we've identified this company in the med tech uh, area that needs this kind of assistance. You know, they've got, they've got on board on their team. They've got great R&D folks. They have a good CFO. They've got nobody for marketing. How can we connect them with somebody that can help them with their marketing mm -hmm. and developing their collateral uh, based on who their potential market is? So help them with that. Help them find the funding whether it's through us or somebody else, help them find the funding, and then, you know, maybe help them actually find that, per, per, that permanent person uh, for that marketing position or any of those other key positions. That's step one is building Venture Start, those three ingredients, the mentorship, the funding, and the key man placement, building Venture Start out uh, so that it can apply across all, of our, all four of our, our verticals. The physical location is also going to be a part of it. Where we sit right now with our med tech vertical is the city of Sacramento has committed uh, within the med zone, right down there off of Stockton Boulevard, um, uh, they have committed to helping fund a position and the space for a medical accelerator type program. Okay. Um, so, and that, that credit for that goes entirely to, well, Laura, uh, who right now is our med tech, our, 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 um, yeah, our med tech program manager, uh, and also Carrie Adams, our board member, is very passionate about it. But I'm, what I'm really good at is seeing good ideas and then stealing them. And, and so I saw that, I thought that was a great idea, and I thought, well, heck, if we were able to sell that to the city of Sacramento, I wonder if I could go sell that same concept to Roseville. And so I went up to Roseville and I said, hey, um, we've got this, you know, this, this, next tech sector, which is all the cool apps and things like that, that we really want to get up and going. Um, we'd like to put it in Roseville. But hey, that's a great idea. We'd love to have you guys. Really? How much would you love it? Would you love it $75,000 a year's wor year worth and you help us get the space? They said, yeah, we think we do love it that much. And so um, they have actually, um, I can't say I have it in writing, but they've verbally made available uh, about 7,500 square feet um, for a next tech accelerator opportunity out there. Um, and again, going back to the idea of uh, I'm not smart enough to think of great ideas, so I'm just going to go steal them. Well, I wonder if there's anybody around here that has experience 
opening up a co-work space where you have to figure out the formulas on price per square foot. Brandon, how the heck are you? And so, you know, hopefully in 2015, you might see a partnership between Sarda and Urban Hive uh, in locating these things because I don't want to be in the business of property management. I mean, he's, he's good at this. He's got the formula all figured out. So why not go partner with him instead of trying to build it myself? And so that's really what we're going to try to encourage at Sarda in, in our, uh, not just in our business culture, but in helping startups get going is that whole notion of there's a good established marketplace here in Sacramento for almost anything you can think of. You come up with any new idea, and there's a user base here in Sacramento. There's a reason that national products do their testing in Sacramento, because we have a user base for almost anything. So why isn't Sarda taking these companies and introducing them to that user base, playing a more active role in getting these companies connected? So that's one of the things we will be doing. One of the other things that we will be doing along those lines is um, we, we want to create the environment here where we, where we nurture what's here. We, we, we build what's here. But we know there's an awful lot going on not too far away that we might have a role bringing here. Yeah. Where this idea really came from it was uh, a meeting that I just had recently out at uh, the Graduate School of Management at UC Davis, where I was asked to come out and talk to a group of angel investors out of the Silicon Valley who are focused on medical technology investment. They're the life sciences angels, is what they call themselves. And they're looking east. They're looking inland for new ideas, for new things to invest in. And so I was called there to say, to help them understand what are some of the things going on. I thought, well, you like our ideas so much, how about you put some of your money up here? And so uh, it got me thinking about something, and I, subsequent to that, about three days later, had a lunch with a guy who runs an ag tech accelerator in Palo Alto. And he's up here for the same reason. He wants to get his companies introduced to customers up here and all the rest. And I said, do you make investments in these companies? Yeah. Well, if you put a half million bucks into a company and down where you are, it gives them five months worth of running room, wouldn't it make more sense to have them right here where it gives them nine months worth of running room? And by the way, their customers are right here. And by the way, we can facilitate those introductions and uh, we can help them locate here. We can provide them a soft landing here. And so it spawned this idea of, hey, what we can build, we'll build. What we can't build, we'll bring. And let's go and start establishing relationships with venture capitalists, angel groups, accelerators down there, explain to them the value proposition of doing business up here where it's more affordable, where we can, we can create those relationships, direct access to customer base, um, get you plugged in where you need to be plugged in for your technology, for what it is you're trying to accomplish. Because we have those relationships, and the Sacramento region is small enough, and, and folks want to help people enough to where that still exists. The Bay Area, that doesn't exist. But the Bay Area has, has you know, because I, I work with a lot of startups here, uh, and I went through the, actually, uh, Velocity VC's accelerator program, mm -hmm. and the ecosystem is really different. Yep. Uh, and uh, and I, one thing I, is that you could go, be in the Bay Area, you could throw a rock and you hit five venture capitalists. Yep. And actually, I was in a place where there were literally hundreds of venture capitalists with lots of money. Yep. And um, the other thing is you hit a rock, you throw a rock and you hit, uh, you know, you hit five incubator programs. Mm -hmm. Y, y Combinator, uh, Plug and Play, right. The Nest, Founder Space. Uh, and that's what I don't see here. In fact, I've almost been suggesting to startups here that they need to go to join an incubator, go to an incubator. Unfortunately, this is my, my what I'm what I'm telling them is that that's what they need to do in order to get the you know get in front of the capitalists, get in front of get the mentorship. Mm -hmm. Because there's a few programs here, but it's really you know it, it's it's not feeding the ecosystem. No, you're right, and that, and that's the that's the first key. The first key is build it. We have to build that here. We 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 need when you come across a company that you think has a, a technology or an idea that is marketable, that is investment worthy, but they, they've got to smooth out the rough edges, 
the, we need a place here for you to be able to refer them. So that's the build it component. The bring it component is for those companies that are down there that have had seed investment, but now they're being kicked out of the nest. And again, I, I go back to what I know. Cars Direct, the, the biggest problem we had at Cars Direct was in our transition from Idea Lab out to our first, we're on our own. That was the toughest. Mm -hmm. I, it, it, it almost cratered our business. Just that move out from the nice, warm, safe confines of Idea Lab, where we didn't have to worry about our own IT needs, that was met for us. We didn't have to worry about our own accounting needs, that was met for us. And us having to launch out and do that on our own. So what I'm saying is, those accelerator programs down there, at some point, the oh, companies have to leave. I, I and so that. let's give them that nice, safe place to come where, where, where the soft landing exists, where the price of doing business is a whole lot less, and where we can actually have a direct impact on connecting them with the user base that is meaningful to them. And I think personally, as I do the startup, I know that uh, the they rent like overnight tripled. Mm -hmm. And they were forced to move into the founders, literally their garage or her apartment. And I don't even know if they're surviving. I it's been a while since I've heard it, but it, it was a fatal blow to them. And they, uh, they had a product, they had some momentum, but I think it was a fatal blow to them. They can, they didn't survive. Yeah. So that's actually, you know, that's actually, and actually, whenever I go there, I always talk about how, you know, we have not, just what a great environment here is, and in, and in, into in the Sacramento region where. You know, you're in, in, in San Francisco, and you're paying $3,500 for a one-bedroom apartment. Right. And then, you know, office space and, you know, startup space is even much more, is even more astronomical. That's right. So I think there is a great yeah, opportunity you, for you, that. You have, you have the highest residential real estate costs in the nation. You have the second worst traffic in the nation. You have the fifth highest uh, uh, business rent costs in the nation. And they endure that five days a week just so that they can spend their weekends up here where we live. Right. So I think we're in a good spot, and I'm, I'm glad you're really working on that. Uh, um, and by the way, yeah. it's not just me working on it, and it's not just Sarda working on it. What I just described to you and our marketing strategy into the Bay Area, into the Gold Coast of Southern California, the Malibu, Santa Monica, Marina del Rey, into the San Diego, La Jolla area, that marketing strategy is the GSEC marketing strategy. That is the CEO group that just merged with SACTO, that's got Barry Broom coming in, that's their marketing strategy. They're going in California to California businesses, and they're saying, you've made the decision for whatever reason, you've made the business decision to stay in California. You're here. Well, if you've made the business decision to be in California, come to the part of California that makes the most sense financially for you to be in. We've got much better employee retention rates than they do in the Bay Area or Southern California much lower operating costs, much better quality of living for your employees, all those things. So that's the message that's going to be coming from GSEC. And they're going to be spending between 2 and $4 million a year on that messaging in these marketplaces. Well, they're going to spend 2 to $4 million a year softening the market for us to go in with the same message. They're targeting the more mature companies, the more developed companies, that you know are already big and sizable and now instead of opening an R&D facility right next door trying to, to trying to pay 32 bucks a foot um, right next door in Palo Alto come 70 miles inland and and have it for seven bucks a foot right so that's going to be so again I'm not smart enough to think of this stuff on my own I just see good ideas and steal them so that's going to be their message so that's going to be our message and, and it's going to be, you're going to see, you already see right now, and I've been here since 1970, and now granted, I wasn't really paying attention to economic development initiatives when I was three years old, but I did start in about 1989 paying attention to it, and I can tell you without a doubt, there is more focus on redeveloping Sacramento, both physically and from a brand standpoint, right now than there's ever been, ever. And you see it with the $400 million going into the arena. You see it with the rail yards project. You see it with some stuff we've got going on out in Placer County with a new four-year university coming, with a satellite uh, a Sac State campus coming. There, there are literally hundreds of millions, if not billions, of private sector dollars that are being put into the physical redevelopment of this area. 
we, we have such a great opportunity to be out telling that story. And it's creating an excitement. You know, it used to be, well, come to Sac what's in Sacramento? Well, now we got stuff. Hey, we got the, 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 the Giants farm program right here now. So you're in the Bay Area, get up here, meet these players when you can actually get their autograph. You're a Giants fan already in the Bay Area, come on up. Uh, with that, I'm going to leave the questions to the audience. Phil? Are there any uh, incentives going on? Uh, you know? well, use the mic. Oh, sorry. Any incentive, in addition to what you're saying, in terms of bringing the companies here, any incentives going on by the local governments to try to bring maybe some of the bigger companies to this area? Uh, not that I'm aware of actively right now. Um, the the local governments, the, the ability to provide incentives along those lines is relatively small because most of what local governments, how we collect our revenue, is either dictated to us by the state or it's set in formula by voter-approved referendums or initiatives, okay? And so what folks in the local government have by way of tools to actually create incentives that differentiate one from the other relatively small. What they can do, rather than incentives, meaning if you come here, we'll rebate you taxes or things like that, what they can do, and what we've tried to do in Placer County is, for certain projects, here's what we're going to commit to in terms of timeline for EIR processing. Here's what we're going to commit to in terms of timeline for uh, infrastructure planning. Uh, here's what we'll do in terms of phasing out your fees and those kinds of things. So you, what you can control are the various cost points that businesses have when they do move, when they do relocate. You, we have the discretion to say, we're not going to make you write a big fat check right up front. We'll let you spread it out over, over a period of time. So to the extent that we have that ability, we do do that. But when you're talking about things like, uh, like taxes, general business operating tax and all those, those aren't on a city or county by county basis. So you had mentioned uh, Roseville and Fulf, uh, Roseville and SAC maybe contributing to an incubator. Mm -hmm. Are there any other cities that you're working on? Um, uh, Davis is the obvious choice for our ag tech right. initiative. Uh, and so I've been chatting with Rob White out there uh, about, about a coordinated effort with the city of Davis out there. And um, I believe that Folsom is the obvious location for our clean tech initiative, um, based on what's already there right. with Jack's program. But also, if, if you are a clean tech company, if you're not in SMUD's territory, I don't know what you're thinking. A SMUD is, and, and I'm not saying this just because there's a SMUD person here, Although they are a member of our board and a big contributor. Um, no, but SMUD is, is, is bar none the best utility in the nation for working with companies that uh, are coming up with uh, energy efficiency, energy conservation me measures. They introduce technology into their supply stream. Uh, they work with companies uh, to, to introduce them to customers. They're, they're fantastic in that regard. So. The clean tech needs to be in SMUD's territory, so getting them in Folsom does that. Ag tech needs to be in Davis. Med tech needs to be in the med zone. And, uh, and I really like the idea of the next tech being up in Roseville. I, um, I talked to an incubator in, in Miami, and they, ha they have an uh, incubator where the city actually contributes something like, a, I want to say, 20 k per company, and then they have no equity, equity requirements. It's, you know, they're, they're actually funding each of these little, like, 10 startups. In your incubator, and mm -hmm. what types of things are you seeing? You know, that the cities are, are are offering. So there are economic development grants that are available for these purposes, um, and I have already had conversations with a couple of jurisdictions where we're not looking to f locate a physical presence, but they understand the dynamic spillover effect of having a vibrant entrepreneurial culture here in the area. And so there is some receptivity to uh, some of the economic development grant conversations. But you do have, for instance, City of Sacramento, who said, we'll contribute 75 grand for the position and provide the space. You have the City of Roseville that said, we'll provide you the space, and they're considering the contribution for the position. That's great.
That's great. Uh, do you have questions? Nuggets? I couldn't answer all the questions. Uh, what, what, what? Do you have any thoughts about how can we cultivate qualities that are from the this area, the qualities of uh, creativity and innovation? What can we do to really build those? I, I appreciate the question. I I'm even more appreciate the way that you introduced it because you're right. It it all too often, especially in the, in the the tech industry, uh, we hear all the great stories. We hear the home runs. You don't hear about the strikeouts. And one of the best things that happened to me early on in my life after I ran for the board of supervisors and won as a kid, and I do say kid when I was 24 years old was I turned around four years later and I ran for the state legislature and I lost. And that was perhaps the best thing that ever happened to me because I never took victory for granted from that point on. Um, I didn't work quite as hard when I ran for the, the legislature. Likewise, in, in uh, the business world, I came out of Cars Direct. It was a great success. Um, I got involved with uh, another uh, renewable energy company. We, we took um, our company, we, we rolled it into an existing public shell, and, and, uh, and we did some good stuff there. And then I started a, a, another company, uh, Job Fairs Online, eJob Fairs. I spent $330,000 of my own money, and it went bye-bye. And these things happen. And uh, entrepreneurship is hard. It's really hard because you're the one that sits there and realizes, damn, that's more money going out. And how are we doing with our product development? And how are we doing with meeting our sales targets? And how are we? And, and so you're the one that's up at three o'clock in the morning. And so, you know, the, you're you're right that that we hear all the stories about all the the great successes, but a lot of the great successes are built on tremendous failures. But they were people who just failed and decided, I'm not done. I'm going to go do something else. And hopefully they learned something from that failure and, and, and they succeeded. But celebrating success is just, it's so important. Um, but when we talk about celebrating success, it can't just be, hey, isn't it great that uh, Homzada just raised $10 million or whatever it is. It's not just that. It's celebrating, isn't it great that John Bedrozik, after, after hitting it pretty good with his first company, was willing to turn right around, put his own money back into this company, work his ass off, go through all the stresses again, and do another one. Isn't that great? Let's celebrate the effort. Let's celebrate the initiative, uh, the creativity, the desire, the drive. Not just, you got a lot of money, congratulations. And, and because that's really, as humans, at our most basic level, that's what we all crave. You know, we all crave that recognition. You worked hard. Congratulations. You deserve the success you got. Congratulations. And so that's a big part of what SART has always tried to do. So I've always tried to celebrate success and, and point out in the region, hey, there are a lot of good things going on here. Yeah. And it's really not an overnight success. Like even with John, in the case of John, it, even though he had, had it established, it took him a couple of years just to get that second round of funding. Oh yeah, and and to learn the space too. That's so right. it's it's you know these overnight success usually take years and years and years of just hard work. That's you it. know? Well, and and it's all everything that goes into it. I mean, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be where I am today with Sarda, with with uh, with VidGage, with with any of these if I hadn't quite frankly flamed out in in e job fairs. Learned a lot, moved on. Anybody else? One more question. Uh, two more questions. Okay, one, Monica, go ahead. Yeah, I'd like to know what are Sarda's efforts to reach out to the next generation? So, Sarda doesn't actively have a role in the K 12 education process right now. Uh, but it's interesting that you, you raise that because there's recently been conversation because there's a lot of attention being paid by corporate America, the folks uh, here in Sacramento who are, you know, national, multinational corporations, to the education component. Uh, Dave Butler, who's also a Rockland City Council member, um, Dave Butler is a, a friend of mine, 
And so I've been talking with him about SARTA helping to develop a curriculum that NextEd would then deploy. We're not, we're not set up to deploy curriculum within schools. There are other folks that can do that. But uh, develop a, a, an entrepreneur's track type of curriculum uh, that help folks understand risk reward and what that all means. But you know, the, the bigger challenge anymore is just the, the notion of good old fashioned hard work. Um, uh, unfortunately, I, and, and this is what I fear in the, for our collective future, uh, the, the, we've got it, we, the entitlement mentality, you know, the I get a trophy because I showed up notion. Um, my God, when, when I was growing up playing Little League, you only got a trophy if you won the championship or you had the worst record in the league. You got the sportsmanship trophy if you had the worst record in the league. And you only wanted the one trophy. You didn't want the other trophy. But everybody else in between didn't get a trophy. And, um, and so that's, that's a challenge. I mean, it, 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 but, but SARTA can play a role, I believe, with our partners at NextEd in maybe working toward developing uh, an entrepreneurial track to get people to open their eyes to the possibilities of uh, acquiring, as you indicated, those marketable skills and then uh, positioning themselves where they could, if they come up with an idea or they know somebody that has an idea, they can help that people bring, uh, that, those people, uh, that person bring that idea through to fruition. You know, I'll just say that there, are, uh, there is such a huge need for people to go in science and development uh, I, I know there's a huge, uh, there's a huge developer sucked into the Bay Area, and uh, you know you can't find really good developers, and uh, it's hard for uh, you don't seem to be you know kids aren't a lot of kids aren't seem to be going into the sciences, and uh, although I have to note that uh, Monica's son uh, was actually the winner of the STEM award from Ami uh, Cong Congressman Ami Bear's uh, district, and her son actually had this great project that was really a uh, in my opinion, on the graduate level, so. Nice. Congratulations. Um, there was a question uh, that's coming out there. Are the, the community colleges and the universities uh, graduating <clears throat> students with with the skills necessary to step in and and become participants? Well, in in my in my sort of role, that's not really the conversation that I'm having, uh, because quite frankly, I other than going to established businesses here in the area, uh, like Moss Adams, and asking them to support our mission. Uh, my focus is on, on providing the needs of the entrepreneur. Um, and so the existing businesses, the existing employers, the business retention efforts associated with providing that, that, that skilled workforce is the purview more of the chamber, uh, which is why they absorbed NextEd, why NextEd came back in with them. And so a lot of folks working to meet that need, that's really not SARTA's purview, but it is, it is an issue. From, a, from, a, from, an employ, from an employer standpoint, finding, finding talent, local talent is an issue. Yes. And like, like you just said, if, there, if there's a, a flight to the Bay Area, then there's a retention. No, well, I'll just put it, and since we have someone from uh, Congressman Ami Bear's office, uh, Sacramento State's, uh, you know, I know a few people that work, that teach that, um, that uh, teach at the computer science, uh, they aren't teaching, none of the, to the computer science graduates actually know how to do iOS development, Android development. And I was stunned to find this because it's like the hottest thing. And I remember talking to him, so you're basically producing computer science majors that I have no use for. And he goes, yeah. So they actually have to, after they graduate, they actually have to go find some other, either go into, work with a company that'll teach them the skills or they have to go online and, and find that skills. And so, it's a, um, you know, they talk about this, there are a lot of good jobs, I mean, but there's just not enough talent to provide it. And I've talked to a couple of lawyers, and their sole purpose is they provide H, H1, what is the H1 visas for, for people to come here. And, uh, and I just talked to one company, they, they, they hired a, a, a developer, an iOS developer from India, and they're paying them a quarter million dollars. Uh, and they just can't find that here, and it's it's crazy, and, and we're just not growing them here, or they're just not going. I don't know what it is. Um, and Laura, you had a question. I just 
Uh-oh. Can I just make a comment on um, some of the work that Sarah has done with, with K-12? Through um, is like um, next ed has come to us to be the bridge between their programs and the experts in the tech company so we use our rolodex to help connect them for example there's a roundtable project coming up for next ed that um, we have made the connections for that those roundtable projects with tech company ceos in, in the region and then also we have there's been a couple of youth hackathons and while sorry hasn't put on the hackathon we have helped to get the the mentors the judges and the coaches for that sort of thing so while it's not our primary mission um, we do use the relationships that we have to connect some of those programs to the um, to the technology executive and we also have programs where we allow kind of on a scholarship basis college students to come to our big big tech events so uh, we do try to give them exposure, but we don't develop our own programming. And then, uh, Patricia? Um, having worked for a multinational in the past, um, I have heard Sacramento has been challenged in, in marketing itself. And SAR has done a real good job of raising our visibility as far as marketing goes, particularly in the, the pitch fest arena in recent years. Do you foresee uh, growing that, diversifying that, and taking our best pitches here and bringing them on the national and international scale has really helped us with our marketing as a research? Sure. Uh, the, where, where I hope we're able to uh, accomplish that goal is by having a series of good uh, success stories come out of our initiatives at SARTA, um, the, uh, the way that we are kind of re remodeling our, our existing offering, uh, you're aware of the, the different verticals that we have. The, the whole focus of the verticals is going to be, given that the nature of Venture Start as I identified it and providing the, uh, the mentorship and, and the funding and the key man placement, the whole purpose of the verticals is going to be to identify those companies within those sectors that are essentially worthy of consideration for uh, introduction to that venture start program and helping that the objective of the the med tech vertical will be learn about all the companies in the area in that sector identify those that that seem to have it together help them get to the point where they are they are worthy of getting into this uh, this venture start program and out of that venture start program um, have all kinds of great stuff that we can broadcast not just here but statewide and 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 to the nation um, for instance you know if as you were at TechCon um, and you you saw the the pitch fest that we did there um, in 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 quality and quantity better than pitch related events that have been going on for years quite frankly uh, I have people and I won't name names of the other programs but I have people who have been actively involved as mentors in other pitch programs who went to TechCon who said your companies outperform what we see in in our stuff and and so we think that over time that's only going to get better because all year long they're going to be worked with and positioning themselves for that for that opportunity for that moment so I, we're going to kind of actually run over our time uh oh uh but anyway i'm I, a politician we do that <laughs> <laughs> anyway what i'd like to do is present oh, you with this you. this is uh, actually uh handmade by a, a local uh craftsman he's actually a, a u.s uh, air force veteran oh very nice and i'd like you to thank you for coming here and uh, helping uh Educate us and inspire and connecting uh, fellow entrepreneurs. So That's thank you very great. Much. Thank, thank you. Thank you all very much for your